All right, well, welcome everybody to the Unapologetic Apologist, episode six. I'm very glad to have my next guest on. He is the founder of freethinkingministries.com is his website. You can follow him on Twitter at TS Express. That's TS, the letter X, T-R-E-S-S. Tim Stratton, thanks so much for being here, sir. Man, it's an honor to be here with you, Stoneman. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Of course. Well, I'm That's very excited. Here. <laughs> I've put you through quite enough getting you on here. Yeah. <laughs> it's been quite well getting the set up, but I'm glad we're doing this. I think it'll definitely be worth it. Um, I guess for people who don't know you all that well, I guess just give us a brief history of your background, how you came to faith, and what ultimately led you to want to start Free Thinking Ministries. Well, how I came to faith, uh, let's see, I was born in 1973, and it was around 1977 at a very young age. It was right before Star Wars came out, <laughs> and uh, my great-grandpa just died. I had no idea what death was at that time, and uh, my mom was trying to explain it to me, and she used some of my little toys, my little action figures. Well, I guess they weren't really action figures back then. Uh, they were called Weeble Wobbles. You're probably too young to know what those are, but... Uh, was the daycare, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, uh, the, the the outer shell, the clear outer shell of this Weeble Wobble was cracked, so you could take it off. And she was explaining to me that that was like the soul. And so she said that my great-grandpa just died, and she explained to me what the soul was, and she slid that outer shell off of the little uh, action, or the little toy, little character, slid that off, and then she put it up on top of a, a shell that was really high up. I couldn't see it. And she said, it's, that's heaven. That's where Jesus is at. And your great grandpa is with, with Jesus in heaven right now. And it's you can't see it, but it's so great up there. It's better than anything you can imagine. And someday, if you have Jesus in your heart, uh, you can uh, be reunited with your great grandpa. You'll see him again and you'll meet Jesus and you'll be with Jesus. And, you know, the way my mom explained it to me, she obviously took a lot more time and uh but it clicked at a young age, right? I think right before my fourth birthday. I actually remember it. Uh, one of my first memories. I don't remember it well, but I do remember it. And uh, I remember praying and asking Jesus to live in my heart. And at that time, I had this little idea of a little Jesus actually living in my heart. <laughs> but as I grew older, I understood what that meant. But anyway, so I prayed the prayer at a really young age. But I took it for granted. I kind of figured, well, Everybody's parents must tell them about Jesus <laughs> growing up yeah. and, uh, you know, getting into even I think in, I was in second grade then at one point and I started realizing, wow, you know, I just met somebody who wasn't a Christian. And I remember he told me he was Baha'i and I was like, what does that even mean? And so I went home and asked my parents what that meant. And they told me, yeah, that some people believe different things. But still, growing up in the middle of Nebraska, the vast majority of people uh, at least went to church and would at least claim to be Christian. But then when I went to college, I realized, man, uh, you know, in the, in the early 90s, going to college, uh, I realized not everybody is living for Jesus anymore, or at least for, they're not even pretending. Right. And, uh, you know, and I kind of got sucked in into some wrong crowds there for a while. And during that time, um, really felt the Holy Spirit working in my life. And uh, then around that time, uh, a band called DC Talk came out with a song called Jesus Freak. I went to the concert. Um, I went to this concert. I heard the song for the first time, and it uh, just changed my life. You know, they're talking about living for Christ no matter who's around, no matter what anybody else thinks. They don't care what anybody else thinks. They're going to be Jesus Freaks. So I'm like, all right, I'm all in. And uh, that's when I devoted my life to Christ. Yeah, I, I prayed the prayer at a young age, but I committed my life 24-7 to Christ at a DC Talk concert. And wow. uh, so, yeah, that song, and you know, that song's definitely got a special place in my heart. But, uh, yeah, so since then, um, I've been doing ministry. I went into youth ministry right after that. Uh, and shortly after that, kids started asking good questions that I kind of answer. And that led me into apologetics. And so now I've devoted my life to being a Jesus freak through <laughs> the apologetics um, venue, I guess. So there's a, my life in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'll do it. Going to college. When I first went to college, I didn't know anything about apologetics. I yeah. watched 
William Lane Craig debate and just debated everybody based on that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Funny how that works. No, yeah. but, but that analogy uh, with the action figure, I mm -hmm. think it is almost the perfect segue into what we're going to be talking about. Because we're going to be talking a lot about free will. Oh, yeah. And of course, what, what always comes up in that conversation is, well, do we have a soul or do we not have a soul? Right. Yeah. And so I think for a while we all just took for granted, well, obviously we have free will. Obviously we can choose. But kind of the rise of the of the atheist is they're starting to say, well, if material is all there is, then there can't be an immaterial realm. There can't be a soul. Yeah. And if it's not a soul and we're just matter, there's no real free will. So I guess yeah. let's start at the very beginning. How would okay. you argue if we do have free will and we're not just a material body? Yeah. So, okay. So what do you want me to talk about? What, why we have free will or why should we well, I think we have a soul? Um, well, well, let's start with, you know, atheists often say, well, neuroscience can show that the brain is all there is, that you don't need a soul. In other words, you know, we can yeah. scan the brain. And if I'm going to raise my arm like this, you see certain points of my brain light up. So right. you don't need a soul. You just need a brain. Yeah. How would you respond to that claim, I guess? Well, yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree that if matter is all that exists, it's really hard to see how anything would, uh, you know, or, or let's just say it th this way. If nature is all that exists, and by nature I mean things that can be tested by, uh, you know, through physics and chemistry and biology and, you know, through science, right? If nature is all that exists and science is the study of nature, well, if, if nature is all that exists, then it's hard to see how anything would be free from the laws of nature, right? <laughs> it seems the, the laws of nature would determine everything about nature. And so uh, it seems to me, and I think even most atheists, uh, would agree, uh, and and definitely you get this uh, at a you know at a popular level and at a more academic level from some guys that 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 there is no such thing as free will because they assume that all that exists is nature, uh, and so if you're going to assume that there's nothing other than nature or supernatural, then I would agree with them based on that assumption that I don't see how uh, free will could exist, and by free will. Uh, I simply mean an ability to choose between or among a range of options, each of which is compatible with one's nature. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so people talk about well, what do you what do you mean by free will? And I say, okay, I'm talking about libertarian free will. And there's a whole bunch of different definitions of of libertarian free will. But basically, what I argue for is, hey, if you ever have an ability to choose between at least two options. And both of these options are compatible with your nature, then you have libertarian freedom. And so, if all that exists is nature, and 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 everything is only matter, if all that exists is matter, and then all that exists is matter in motion based on physics and chemistry, um, I don't see where how a human would have an ability to choose between a range of options, both of which. Or each of which are consistent or compatible with the nature. I just, you know, I would agree with the atheist on that point. So yeah. if they make that assumption, I, I would agree with uh, their conclusions. I just disagree with their assumptions, and for good reason. So, so that's kind of along the lines of what Sam Harris argues. Um, how would right. you respond, to Michael Shermer, who claims that free will is kind of an emerging property through evolution? So something he would say was, well, our free will is limited, right? Like I can't choose to fly, or I can't I choose agree. strength. Yeah, so, I agree with that. And then he'll talk about, you know, for example, in rats, you know, more and more primitive animals, their range of choices is limited. And, but as the brain becomes more complex, the range of options opens up. And so it gets to a point where you can't possibly predict what somebody would choose. So for all intents yeah. and purposes, we have free will because you, can, you can't predict what the well, it's, predictions are irrelevant here. We're not talking about what we can predict. Yeah. We're talking about if somebody has a real categorical ability to choose between a range of options each compatible with their nature yeah well i think he probably seems more it's the it's the complexity like there's an emergency complexity yeah. in the brain it's just becomes so complex the amount of choices right. well bottom line if all that exists is matter and, and nature then there is no re it might look to us as if there's a range of options but there's not right. there's only one thing it's all determined uh you know given the initial conditions of the big bang the laws of nature, uh, everything is determined. Um, and what seems like might have been a limited range of options really wasn't. There was only one thing you could have actually done in that situation. And 
you know, I mean, people try to get around it by uh, appealing to complexity and things like that. Just does, that's irrelevant. What matters is do you have a real categorical ability to choose between or among a range of options, each of which is compatible with your nature? And if so, then you have libertarian freedom. Um, if not, then you don't. All is determined and up to things other than you. So uh, <laughs> when people say uh, that determinism is true, uh, if it's the naturalists like Sam Harris or uh, the uh, the, the Christian, um, maybe a, a Calvinist who might say that God determines all things. Well, then whatever you are, <laughs> you're affirming that something other than you determines everything about you. And that would also include all of your thoughts, your actions, your beliefs and your behaviors, your intentions. And even Sam Harris says thoughts um, emerge from background causes over which we are unaware and over which we have no control. Um, he, he makes it clear that these things, even our thoughts and beliefs, are not up to us on his deterministic view. And I'm arguing, hey, there's got to be some things that are up to us, or else rationality goes out the window, knowledge is illusory. Um, and, uh, and so if Sam Harris is going to say that he's a rational person and that he's delivering uh, knowledge claims, then he's offered a, well, well he's, he, he's bringing self-defeating statements <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to the table. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, so that's I mean, why I said it was like, it's, you can believe, like, it's, it's possible we don't have free will. That certainly is a possibility, but, but as far as I can tell, you can't get outside that. Like, you can't even, you right. can't, for the second you're arguing for it, you're assuming it's false. You're assuming I can rationalize to even offer reasons right or this claim that would negate my ability to reason towards something yeah it's weird and to me the claim that things get so complex it, it was what like what you said it just, all that saying is we can't predict it but just because right. we can't predict it doesn't mean that the outcome yeah. isn't fixed it just means it's so complex right that we, we right. can't it. yeah a, a, a complex uh determined system is still determined mm -hmm. right yeah. i mean you, you can uh, set up the most complex uh, domino setup you can think of. Well, when you push that first domino, everything that's going to happen is determined no matter how complex it is. So complexity is irrelevant. We're talking about a real categorical ability at the, uh, for, for you, the thing you call I, to at least sometimes be able to choose between a range of options, each of which is compatible with your nature. And so think about this. I mean, you bring, bring up the ability to reason. If you, or the thing you call I, does not have the ability to, to evaluate uh, the concept of libertarian freedom and judge it as either good, option A, or bad, option B, then you're not rational. You have no uh, ability to e evaluate an idea, or a thought, or a belief, or a concept. But if you do have an ability to evaluate a concept like libertarian freedom, as either good or bad. Well, welcome to the land of the free. Mm -hmm. Land yeah. of the free, uh, right? <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Yeah, you if go. you've got an ability to choose between a range of options, then you would have, each of which is compatible with your nature, then you have an ability to judge or evaluate a certain thought or idea or belief or concept. For example, libertarian freedom. If you can sit back and, and think, uh, libertarian freedom, I, you know, it's, is it a good idea or a bad idea? I will judge it as a bad idea. Well, hey, if, if you've got two options there, well, if you've just judged it as a bad idea, well, actually, you've got libertarian freedom. Right. All right. So that's really nutshell right there. But, uh, you know, I like to, I like to say it like this. Do you possess the ability to reject incoherent thoughts and beliefs? in favor of coherent thoughts and beliefs, yes or no? Now note, I've given you uh, incoherent thoughts and beliefs uh, and coherent thoughts and beliefs, and I've asked you to choose between, <laughs> uh, do, do you have an ability to do that, yes or no? I've given you another range of options. Yes or no is a range of options. You've got two to pick from. Now, if you are determined to only pick yes or no, and you cannot even consider the other one. Really, you could not have chosen it. 
then how do you know your beliefs on the topic are any, are any good? And why should anybody else listen to you? Why should you trust your answer? Why should anyone else listen to your opinions about anything, including that on, on this topic? And, and look, if you answer no, that you do not have an ability to choose or to judge the concept of libertarian freedom as either good or bad. Well, then, and if you say, no, I don't have that ability. Well, then libertarian freedom exists anyway. If you affirm, um, <laughs> if you affirm your ability to reject yes in favor of no, then you tacitly affirm yes, that you do have that ability. So, um, you know, now I'll tell you this, there's also uh, atheists and, uh, you know, atheist philosophers and naturalist philosophers who do reject the idea of the soul, who have come to agree with me here, um, or we're on the same page. I'm thinking of guys like John Searle, Evan Fales, I think Nagel would be there too. Um, those are the guys top of my head. You know, these guys, definitely not Christians, they're atheists, and I believe they're naturalists, but but they're, they realize that if, you, if we don't have libertarian freedom, then say goodbye to rationality. So it's not yeah. just Christians that are coming to this conclusion. It's, it's atheist philosophers as well who are saying, man, if we don't have libertarian free will, then we, we cannot engage in the process of rationality. And if we cannot engage in a process of rationality, then we never gain knowledge based on rationality. So say goodbye to the vast majority of knowledge claims, too. Um, we don't have any justification for anything um, that we believe, or at least most of it. And so, yeah, it's not just Christians that are coming to this position. Now, I will say that the Christian worldview makes sense of the position, and and uh, and I think um, you can do that with uh, the, an, an argument that I've called the free thinking argument against naturalism. I have several free thinking arguments, uh, but this is one of the first ones I came up with. I think back in uh, 2012, it goes like this: uh, it's eight steps. Um, it's four premises, three deductive conclusions, and then a final abductive conclusion, which is really the start of a new argument, but it goes like this. Premise one, if naturalism is true, human nature does not include an immaterial soul. Two, if human nature does not include an immaterial soul, then humans do not possess libertarian freedom or libertarian free will. Three, if humans do not possess libertarian free will, then humans do not possess the ability to gain inferential knowledge via the process of rationality. Four, humans do possess the ability to gain inferential knowledge via the process of rationality. All right, here's some deductive conclusions. Five, therefore, humans possess libertarian freedom or libertarian free will. Six, therefore, human nature includes an immaterial soul. Seven, therefore, naturalism is false. And then eight, uh, abductive conclusion, the best explanation for the existence of the immaterial soul is the biblical view of God. Um, mm. And then I have an argument where that's uh, the first premise of another argument, but we'll save yeah. that for another time. Um, so, but definitely, I mean, we've got three deductive conclusions there. Therefore, libertarian free will exists. Therefore, human nature includes an immaterial soul. Um, and then therefore, naturalism is false. Now, I offer... Uh, weaker arguments, I guess, sometimes well, I'll, I'll include the word probably in there. Uh, I'll say if humans um, do not include an immaterial soul, then humans probably do not possess libertarian freedom. Only thing that changes there is deductive conclusion six, and then it just says, therefore, human nature probably includes an immaterial soul. Um, so, yeah, there I you think go. Obviously, apart from the conclusion, the most um, contended premise would be two, if I'm not mistaken, would be that the soul directly relates to libertarian free will, if I'm um, getting it. But I think that's, well, that's laid out so far. Let me, uh, here, let me bring something up here. Actually, um, I would say the most, usually the most controversial premise is three. Uh, but as soon as I Which defend three... And it showed that it's strong, people go to two um, to try to, you know, atheists or anybody that doesn't want my argument to be true, um, they'll go to two. Some of them start with two, but just let me give you a brief defense here yeah. uh, of the argument. Um, so, premise one, uh, basically, premise one is synonymous 
with if naturalism is true, nature is all that exists. Mm -hmm. So that's not really uh, controversial. Nobody really, it, nobody ever starts out attacking that one anyway. So if naturalism is true, nature is all that exists. That's all I mean when I say if naturalism is true, the immaterial human soul does not exist. <laughs> Why? Because yeah. nature is all that exists, okay? Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Premise two is tantamount to if all that exists is nature, then all that exists is causally determined by the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the Big Bang and maybe some quantum events, but none of these things are up to a human, right? So if all that exists is nature, uh, everything is at least probably causally, causally determined by the laws of nature. And or nature itself. Um, so uh, let's see. So yeah, premise two: if all that exists is nature, then all that exists is causally determined by the laws of nature, initial condition conditions of the Big Bang, maybe some quantum stuff. <laughs> but uh, that's the the point there. None of it's up to you. Uh, premise three. Uh, premise three is equivalent with if all things are causally determined then that includes all thoughts and beliefs, all right? Think about that. If all things are determined, that includes all thoughts and beliefs. And if our thoughts and beliefs are forced upon us and we could have never chosen better beliefs, even if there were better beliefs, right. <laughs> but you can't choose them. Um, yeah, so yeah, I lost my, my place here. Um, oh, anyway. If uh, if you can't choose better beliefs when there are some out there, then you you don't have any justification that your beliefs yeah. are any good. Um, so <laughs> you're really left begging the question. And if you beg the you know that's a logical fallacy, and any argument based on a logical fallacy is no argument at all. So yeah. you really lose ground. If you lose grounds of rationality, then you lose. If you don't have an ability to choose between a range of options consistent with your nature then say goodbye to inference to the best explanation. You don't know if it's the best. Right. Well, and the point about that too is when you say best explanation or better beliefs, those terms ultimately become relative because better beliefs right. pertaining to truth or better beliefs pertaining to survival. It could be that was well, what was beneficial to our survival through the process of evolution to have an well, illusion of what reality now, now, you're getting into Alvin Plantinga's work, the evolutionary argument against naturalism. This is close. But I've had some people tell me that, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be anywhere near as smart as Alvin Plantinga, but some people think that this, the argument that I um, am offering is even stronger because at least on evolution, your beliefs are aimed at survival. And if that's the case, there's a good chance they might be true. Not necessarily though. And that's where Alvin Plantinga's yeah. argument, uh, you know, it's got to get your attention. But if all that exists is nature and i mean the laws of nature aren't aimed at anything and, and so if all of your thoughts and beliefs are determined by the fizzing and popping of physics and chemistry it's not aimed at anything mm -hmm. so it's definitely not aimed at truth yeah well that's the weird thing well that's the, even if you make the assumption that what's going to be most beneficial to survival is going to be an aim at truth even if you make that assumption right. if, even the word assumption yeah, assume I can freely assume something. Right. That's not your assumptions aren't even up to you. Yeah. Your assumptions aren't up to you. And then when I say, look, evaluate your assumptions. You can't even do that. That's not up to you either. Now evaluate that thought. As Dr. Uh, you know, William Lane Craig says, a sense of vertigo sets in for everything you think. None of it's up to you. It's all caused by something else, including trying to evaluate the very thought in your head right now. Say hello to vertigo. Right? Yeah. None of it's up to you. A conversation with an atheist friend years back, and I was I was asking him if he believes in free will, and he kept saying, "Well, the more I learn about the universe, the stronger I come to the conclusion that we don't have free will." And I kept trying to challenge him, saying, "But you're saying that you're learning about the universe, which implies yeah. you do have freedom to learn new things about right. the universe." So yeah. I not self contradictory, and his his response to me just kept being, well, "Don't make me try to go into an existential crisis here." <laughs> I was like, well, maybe you should reevaluate your foundational beliefs and see if you come to a different conclusion. If he's got the freedom to do so, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, but if he's going to assume that he does not have the freedom to reevaluate his beliefs, then I mean, the dude's lost. 
Um, yeah. So, I mean, really think about evaluation. If you do not have the ability to uh, evaluate an idea or a foundational belief um, as good or bad, if there's only one possible way you can think about it, then you don't know if you should be thinking about it differently. You can only assume, but that assumption's not up to you either. So, I mean, this is why guys like John Searle, he says rationality only makes a difference if irrationality is possible. And so you've got to have a range of options, both yeah. of which are consistent with your nature if you are to be a so a rational being, it doesn't guarantee all of your beliefs will be coherent or true. Yeah. But it means you have the possibility of thinking things through correctly. Um, you have the possibility of um, being a rational or a reaching coherent beliefs and truth based on justify, you know, you, you have the possibility of having a justified true belief, which is knowledge. So yeah, John Stroll makes it clear that rationality is only possible um, if irrationality is possible. And, um, and that's the only way that rationality is going to make a difference, I think is what he says. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's not just Christians come to, I think the Christian worldview, especially, the, and, and the, you know, there's, there's Christians out there too, that don't hold to, uh, the soul or substance dualism or dualism at all. Guys like Peter Van Inwagen is a phenomenal, uh, philosopher. Love the guy. He argues for libertarian freedom, uh, better than most people, but he's actually a physic, a physicalist, uh, regarding humanity. I don't know why. I don't think that's right. Yeah. But here's a guy that says, hey, there's no soul. We're just a physical thing. But somehow we've got libertarian freedom. Okay, that's more miraculous than, to me than substance dualism. But fine, I don't care. At least he affirms libertarian freedom and he's a Christian. That's great. But then you've got atheists who are like, yeah, these guys are right. If, if you don't have libertarian freedom to think, then say goodbye to rationality. You know, if you have no ability to think otherwise, <laughs> all of your thoughts are forced and determined by something other than you, forced upon you, then you're not rational or you're irrational anyway. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's atheist philosophers that are coming to this position, too. And so that's I want your your listeners or viewers here to, to understand that um, we have good reason to to come to these conclusions. And my point is with the argument I gave you, I think the Christian worldview, especially substance dualism, which I think is uh, a biblical view um, that you are a soul with a body, a soul in the image of God who uses a body, a soul in the image of, uh, of <laughs> the soul in the image of God who at death of the body is freed from the body and will eventually get another body. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the biblical view of that makes great sense if you are a soul in the image of god then you would be something other than nature and therefore it would make sense that you would not be determined by the laws of nature mm -hmm. right you would be yeah. influenced but not determined and so yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean people's like well how, how does the soul get your free will well you would be uh, an immaterial thinking thing in the image of god with an ability to evaluate certain ideas as good bad better the worst <laughs> uh true or false you know you would you would you'd be in the image of god with an ability to choose between a range of options each of which is consistent with your nature and you'd be an immaterial supernatural thing that uses a natural thing uh mm -hmm. your body so there yeah. you go i think that's a good way to to say it because you know one of the objections is that neuroscience show brain activity directly correlates to our behavior yeah and I really like an analogy that William Lane Craig gave, and I think he was actually quoting someone else who originally gave this analogy, but it was that the mind uses the brain the same way a, a musician would use a piano. And so just as yeah. the musician uses the piano as an instrument to make music, so the mind uses the brain as an instrument to interact in the physical world. Yeah, I believe, that's, I believe that's Sir John Eccles. Okay. He, he was, yeah, a neuroscientist that I believe he was a Nobel winning Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, I think, could be wrong. But yeah, he was the one that made that comparison. Yeah, I really like that because there was a debate years back between John Lennox and Michael Shermer. And yeah. Michael Shermer really fought against this idea because he said, well, look, if, if the brain is damaged, then you can, you know, function properly in the world. So it seems much more that the brain would have to do with your actions than some immaterial mind. 
And the, the reason I really like that analogy is because just as if the piano is damaged in some way, right. it affects the musician's ability to make music. So if your brain is damaged, it affects the mind's ability to use it to function properly. Oh, you know what? Uh, that just brings, uh, brings to mind a great conversation I had with my grandpa uh, a few years ago. Uh, he died a couple years ago. But, you know, he, he's a guy, you know, fought in World War II and went to Harvard, graduated at the top of his class. Um, just a brilliant guy. And, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, he's in his 90s uh, a few years ago. And, and he said, Tim, I, he, he kind of had a moment of clarity. He was kind of, you know, really struggling um, with uh, Alzheimer's. And, um, but, but he had a moment and we were, we had a good talk on the phone. He's like, Tim, I'm, I'm not as smart as I used to be. And, and I said, Grandpa, I said, you are, you're brilliant. I said, just, but right now, it's just your brain isn't working like it used to, but your soul is smarter than ever. You as a soul uh, have so much knowledge that you've gained and, and you're having a hard time maybe using a damaged brain, but you are brilliant. And once you are freed from your body, you're gonna be thinking quite nicely and better than ever before. And that was one of my last really good conversations I had with my grandpa. And he thanked me so much. And he said, Tim, you, you just brought me so much peace. So, you know, there's pastoral uh, significance yeah. <laughs> and uh, with understanding this also. Yeah. Um, so I guess before we get into, I guess, kind of free will, um, I guess, theological implications turn towards deterministic version sex of Christianity. Um, so maybe we could jump to the political real quick. Okay. Uh, one, th one thing you've been quite outspoken on, I I've been sharing a lot on social media, is about this abortion law. Yeah. And that um, some of the people in Virginia now, it was the governor and the mayor speaking about it, the implications. Right. So it, it's, it's really weird. So, they, so New York passes this law legalizing abortion up through the third trimester. And so every, every you know, prominent conservatives were outspoken and said, well, this is terrible. This is an infanticide. And then the initial liberal or leftist, I guess you could say, defense of it was, well, no, it's only in cases where the mother's life is at stake. And then, of course, when you actually read into the bill, well, that was like health was actually very broadly defined. Yeah. And then in certain parts where it did specify the life of the mother, they actually democratically took that out of the bill. Mm. They, they, they scratched that part. And so it, it does seem like it's, it's very broadly defined. And I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? Or I, it, it makes my blood boil. I mean, it's, yeah. it's pure evil. And... It, it, you know, and I understand, look, if God doesn't exist, then there is no such thing as objective moral values and duties. Maybe we can get into that. So, hey, if, athe if you think atheism is true, I can at least understand uh, why you don't um, think that abortion is murder. But let me tell you, nothing makes me more frustrated than people who claim to be Christians and support the pro-abortion party. And now, let me tell you, I am not a Republican. I left the Republican Party about 15 years ago um, because I disagreed with things I was seeing in the Republican Party. And I wanted the Democrats to give me a chance. Yeah. Were, no, 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 I was giving them a chance. And they blew it, right? Now, I, I think as a, as a Christian, I'm not going to belong to either party. I, I don't care. If, I mean, people can disagree with me. I'm a, I'm a free-thinking and proud independent, right? But I'm telling you... Um, I, I cannot vote for a for a Democrat right now because of their stance on abortion. Yeah. It is murder. And nothing frustrates me more than a Christian saying, well, there's other issues. Really? Would you say that about Hitler? No. And he only killed six million Jews only. Right? But we're we're going on sixty million and counting murdering of babies. I, I'm sorry, I can't take your moral outrage seriously on any other topic. When, yeah. uh, when you're, we're talking 60 million uh, and counting babies, murdering them. I, I mean, it just blows my mind how anybody yeah, can justify that looking at any other issue. Um, I don't know. What, people what you say, well, what are you, a single issue voter? It's like, well, on this one, can you think of an, a more important issue right now? Right. And like, yeah. I, I wouldn't call myself a Republican. I am a registered Republican. And it's yeah. precisely. Because this isn't some radical leftist stance. This is the national DNC platform stance, which right. is all the way up until birth. That's right. And so I, yeah, I'm going to vote against that. Right. 
you know, and people are like, oh, single issue voter. I'm not a single issue voter, but this is by far the most important one. I mean, by yeah. far. <laughs> and, and, and I said, look, you know, people get mad to compare it to Hitler, right? But take this puts it into context. As soon as you say, well, would you, if, if Hitler, if you were in Nazi Germany at, or at German time, were you going to vote for Hitler or not? Getting him, him in power or not? If you would have known, he was going to do his was to kill the Jews. Or this is the issue big enough, and his policies were perfect. Yes, that you should be a single issue. Guess what? That was six million human. We're not sixty million humans and counting in America, and that's just out of control. I, 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 I can't take the moral outrage on any other topic seriously until somebody gets that one right. Yeah, well, it, it's so weird. Ben, I was listening to Ben Shapiro, and he was saying, you know, that there are some people on the left saying, well, you know, why, why, are, Republic, why are conservatives so mad at this? Because they believe that in the third trimester, it's, it's equivalent to if you were to do an abortion at eight weeks. Right. And what's ironic, though, is the left is affirming the, on the other extreme which is, you know, their whole argument was, well, you know, early on, maybe you can't feel pain yet, or maybe, right. that, or maybe it's not viable yet. But mm. now they're ironically affirming that, no, at, at 40 weeks or at eight weeks is the moral equivalent, whether you aborted or, aborted or not. So yeah. they, they basically just undercut their whole argument by just saying, yeah, it's, it's the woman's choice regardless of, or the doctor's choice, regardless of how far developed it is. Right. Which is, you know, I... <clears throat> Um, I, I do get political quite often. It's usually about this topic. Like I said, there's a couple others that I'm, uh, I, I care deeply about, but this is by far the most important one to me. And I told myself a couple days ago, I wasn't going to get political on social media. I just wanted to work on my dissertation. I'm, you know, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel there. I'm almost done. And I was just going to work on that. And then I said, so well, just let me check Facebook really quick, uh, before I start my uh, research and writing. And I, I saw this video of the uh, politician in Virginia um, trying to pass the bill that you could kill a baby during the, the birth process. Um, Nathan was his name. What's that? Nathan was his last name. I don't remember his first well, name. Well, it was a woman uh, that I that Oh, was... you're talking about uh, Kathy Tran? Yeah, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. I saw that and I, you know, and then I heard other things what the governor was saying and uh, so I felt uh, led to type something on Facebook. It kind of blew up. It kind of, you know, I'm, uh, it was shared quite a bit. I'll read it to you here. Um, I said, this is out of control to my Democrat friends. It's hard to take any moral outrage seriously from anyone who turns a blind eye to mass murder and casts a vote for a politician who fights to keep murder legal and shouts their abortion, especially during the third trimester. I was born at seven months. It seems to me that this makes all who continue to vote for and support the Democrat party an accomplice to murder, and now torturous murder. Now, many of those who vote for Democrats often say things like, well, I'm personally against abortion, or of course abortion is morally wrong, but dot, dot, dot. I said, no, that, or I said, no, this. Planned Parenthood and the abortion slash murder industry love people like you. You are the ones who make this mass murder possible. The hope is not lost. In fact, it is you, the Democrat voter, who can come through and be the hero. Democrat voters need to stop the Democrat Party in their tracks and not shout their abortion, but instead shout, this needs to stop or I am done with you. Democrat voters, especially those who claim to be Christians, need to take to the streets, get on social media, and fight to turn their beloved party around. It's gone way too far. Or they must leave it. And they will not receive your support or your vote until this madness comes to an end. Until I see this public outcry from those who vote for Democrats, I simply cannot take their moral outrage on any other political topic seriously. 
60 million murders and counting outweighs all the other issues combined. That's yeah. what I put on Facebook. And what's really cool is I know that this, I was, I've been contacted by somebody who told me that this Facebook post led to uh, certain people going to the politicians in Virginia um, and really put pressure on them to not pass the law and I or the bill and I, uh, I believe the bill failed. So, I mean, I was told that somebody right. there in Virginia <laughs> was awesome. inspired inspired by my Facebook post. So, um, right. yeah, you just never know what change you can make from your yeah. from your Facebook post. <laughs> I yeah. guess that's the yeah. moral of the story there. Like, don't be afraid to put it all on the line. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's I, I definitely I, I think. I think Democrat voters, people who would normally vote Democrat right now, you guys are the ones that can step up and be the hero here. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not telling you to leave the Democrat Party. I'm telling you, or at least right now, I'm telling you to put pressure on them. Get on your social media account and say, look, I'm a Democrat. I am not going to stand for this. I even had one person based on my Facebook post, you know, a couple people uh, contact me from different parts of the country. And say, look, I'm pro-choice, uh, but not not that this has gone way too far. And like you said, I mean, and I, you know, in my conversations with them, I'm like, look, based on science, um, we know that at the moment of con conception, you're talking about a human, right? Yeah. Uh, science lets us know that. Uh, if people want more on that, I've got a article on freethinkingministries.com called uh, "Pro-Choice: The Wrong Side of History, Science, and Logic." Um, but this individual said, look, um, I am pro-choice, but I will not affirm anything in the third trimester because it's clearly a baby at that point who can feel things. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, and so like Republicans just get out there and show a picture of a baby, like just a couple days before it's born and say, this is what the Democrats are talking about killing, yeah. by the way. So I was like, born at seven months, seven yeah. months, 1973, I was born. Seven months, and yeah, Democrats want to kill me. <laughs> yeah. oh. um, so, anyway, I, I I'm telling you, uh, the part Democrat Party, the stance, the 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 platform will change when the Democrats hear from the Democrat voters. They're not going to change based on what I say because right. they weren't going to get. Well, maybe because I'm an independent who wanted to give them a chance, right? Yeah. But they're not going to care what registered Republicans say, that's for sure. Because yeah. they weren't going to get their votes anyway. But as soon as the Democrat voter, the citizen who has a shred of decency left in them says, hey, Democrat Party, I will not vote for you, even if it's Donald Trump running, right? Even if I hate that yeah. guy, I'm not going to vote. I, I won't vote for him, maybe, right? I, maybe I, I'm just going to stay home and not vote at all. But as soon as the Democrat Party hears that the Democrat voters are not going to issue a vote anywhere, then they will change. They need their votes. And I've heard that one out of all three Democrat voters are actually pro-life. Well, guess what? It's you one third, right? It's you guys that can make the difference. So I'm calling on you. Make the difference. Go to your social media. Get out, get out into the streets and say, I am not issuing a vote for another Democrat again, no matter who it is, from your local mayor to the president or anybody in between. I am not voting for another Democrat until the party changes because this has gone too far. I can't make the change and you can't make the change. But any of the Democrats listening to this, it's you who can step up and be a hero. And it's not just being quiet about it and not voting. If you want to make a difference, you have to let your voice be known. You got to use your Twitter, your Facebook. You got to take to the streets, whatever. You got to get it. You got to make the phone call. Say, I am not voting for a single Democrat again, and I encourage all of my other Democrat friends to join me until the party makes things right. Then we can take their other issues seriously. But yeah. this is way too big. Sixty million murders and counting. You add up all the other things you don't like about the Republican Party. Guess what? It still pales in comparison to sixty million murders of babies and counting. You know, philosophers. Man, you got me going, man. I'm sorry. But no, no. philosophers, when we're when we're discussing uh, 
morality and if objective morality exists or not. One of the things that's always brought up because it's something that everybody seems to agree on is, well, uh, of course, if we know, we just know that it's wrong to torture and kill infants for fun, right? I'm like, and everybody's just like, oh, well, yeah, that's, uh, you can't really get much worse than that. Yeah, okay, we'll give you that. We know that that's wrong. Well, now it's like torturing and killing infants for convenience so that you can go have fun and not worry about the consequences. Yeah. Guess what? It's the Democrat Party who is affirming what philosophers like to show is, of course, this is the one thing that nearly everybody can agree on, that this is wrong. Yeah. Come on, man. I know. Come on, it's gone way too far. Yeah. Well, it's, it's important that we, you're stressing, you know, about Democrats have to talk about, I'm not voting for cert, certain politicians. Again, this isn't a radical leftist position. This is the mainstream Democratic position. Right. And That's it's right. so weird. We're not, how are we supposed to find common ground? People always talk about finding common ground and this and that. And I think Stephen yeah. Crowder brilliantly points out that finding common ground in the absence of truth is not a virtue. Amen. And they've undercut their own argument. It was supposed to yeah. become safe, legal, and rare. Right. You know, now it's abortion through the third trimester. They've undercut that. You know, pe I, I think polarization is a bad thing, but if I'm polarized from somebody who thinks it's okay to kill a baby through the third trimester, I'm okay being polarized from that right. person. That's right. Um, and I'll die and on that hill. They, they've, <laughs> they've just completely give, given up their argument. I mean, even if this bill was only meant to protect, say, a mother... If, if her life was at risk. Never mind that that's not a thing that happens, right? First of all, the majority of, of women who seek late-term abortions aren't seeking them for health reasons or for, you know, her life's yeah. at risk. Yeah. Um, not only that, there there's emergency C-sections that can be done. There can be early yeah. delivery. It's never the case that you have to kill the baby. Right. But so even if that were the case, right, that, you, that this abortion is necessary this late to save the mother's life, yeah. that's still a terrible and tragic thing. Why are they lighting up and celebrating right. with Pink for this terrible, awful, yeah. tragic uh -huh. thing? They completely undercut their own argument. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll just leave it there. Um, yeah. Like I said, I am, uh, I am not a Republican. A lot of people think I am these days. But it's because this issue is way too big. Yeah. No, way I mean, big. look. It's there is no being in the middle on an issue like this, right? And a lot of others, but especially this one. Now, and I've got to tell you, I mean, I've had several people since I posted that on Facebook, people that I'm not even Facebook friends with because it people were sharing it all over the place. Um, but yeah, I had other Democrats contacting me and saying, Yes, Tim, we agree with you, I am going to start being more vocal about this. And I saw people doing it, so man. I want to encourage you guys, no matter who's listening, get this out yeah. there. Uh, make statements like these. Uh, people need to feel this pressure from the voter who would be willing to turn a blind eye to abortion because they like some other cause. You know, and you, you know, I mean, I'm friends with some uh, gay people. You know, some of them will say, "Yeah, my, my LGBT rights or whatever," and we were born this way. Well, look, you want to kill people who would have been born that way. You want to kill them. Yeah. Right? I mean, come on. You you had your uh, gamer is legal. Great. You, okay. Now, now you can leave that. It's legal. Right? <laughs> Let's save some lives here. Let's yeah. save some lives. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm just, that was just on the top of my head. Pick any other issue. Pick, uh, and it just, it pales in comparison. But I don't know. I, you got me going. Yeah, no, so, so uh, you mentioned the moral argument earlier, and I'd actually like yeah. to get into that quite a bit. Okay. It's one of the ones I've been working, you know, really hard on developing beyond, you know, the typical arguments we hear. Yeah. Um, and so one thing that I try to do is I always play devil's advocate with my own arguments, right? I always try to attack them and think, what's the That's best case against my argument? And I try to argue against that. That's even what I'm going to start trying to do with future segments. Maybe we can have you come on and debate my atheist. Yeah. That'd be fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. But so I think the two strongest cases um, an atheist could possibly make against the moral argument is one, they could argue that the good exists, good exists as an abstract platonic object, mm -hmm. and that the process of evolution kind of shaped itself around that so that morality emerged within humans. And so they yeah. had an obligation to one another. Now, I think that one is weaker 
Yeah, there's no there's no objective obligation there. There's no objective, nothing objective there at all. And so yeah. if we're going to talk about objective moral values and duties or moral ob objective moral obligations. How does that make it objective that you ought to, especially if there's no free will? Right. Well, if it's all matter in motion, then whatever happens yeah. just happens. Whatever, you know, Hitler did his thing and it wasn't up to him. That was physics and chemistry. Gandhi yeah. did his thing too, physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There, there are problems with that theory. I'm trying to develop that on the atheist side more. But the one I'm working on more is an argument against moral realism. So one of the things I've tried to conceptualize is we often have terms subjective morality and objective morality, right? And I'm trying to say, one thing I've argued is that, well, either there is a category of morality out there by definition is objective, or there is no such category. And all there is is descriptions of how we've evolved to behave in social structures. Right. right okay, good. So a, de a description as an is. Pardon? Right. So the description, though, tell me if I'm tracking with you, the description of what is just what it is, what it is, right? You're describing what it is, mm -hmm. not how it ought to be. Yeah. Am I tracking with you? Yeah, right, right. Because the, the weird thing, when the atheist, like Sam Harris does this a lot, he'll switch between the terms subjective and objective. Right. Right? Yeah. And so he starts building a foundation on subjective morality, but by, by the time he's gotten to the end of his argument, he's on objective morality, yeah. which he's equated between the two things. So basically I'm saying there either is a category of morality that's objective or there isn't, right? And then you, you, you can describe, well, why do we behave the way we do? You know, what's beneficial to our survival, but you're not discussing that in any kind of moral sense. Right, and, and talking about what's beneficial to our survival, written on this on, on my website, uh, is it objectively good for humans to survive? You know, Agent Smith yeah. and the Matrix uh, would say no, right? And, uh, and I've actually had some atheists tell me that it is bad for humans to thrive and flourish. It's, it's, it's objectively bad, they might say, because we hurt Mother Earth and yeah. the universe. We're bad for the universe. And that was Agent Smith's uh, position in the Matrix. He's, you know, he's uh, interrogating Morpheus before Neo comes to save him. And uh, he's like, you guys are, you know, one thing I've learned about humanity is you're just... Uh, you're like a virus, a cancer, um, and you just destroy the earth wherever you go, you know. And, and so according to uh, Agent Smith um, and, and other liberals in Northern California that I've talked to, <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. It's, they would say it's, it's not objectively good for humans to flourish, uh, that it's actually bad for the universe. And they would, they might, I don't know if they would say it's objectively bad, but they would say it's just bad. So when we say, well, yeah. You know, they would disagree with Sam Harris, I think. Yeah. When, when Harris says, well, we know what's objectively good for human flourishing. They would say, but, but human flourishing is bad. Yeah. Now, I think Sam Harris gets some things right. We are supposed to flourish. We were created to flourish, right? Mm. And so if God created us on purpose or for a specific purpose to flourish, then when we don't, some, something's gone wrong. Something yeah. has missed the mark, sin, right? So we ought to try to flourish from everybody from our neighbors to our enemies is what Jesus made clear. Um, but only on, uh, on theism and Christianity makes the best sense of this. Uh, can we say that humans ought to flourish? It's an objectively true statement that humanity was created on purpose and for the specific purpose to flourish. And thus, if there's something that, if that, if that statement is true, that God created humanity on purpose for a specific purpose, then there is something objectively true about humanity, irrespective of the subjective opinions from humanity. So yeah. even if a human in Northern California says, no, it's not good for humans to flourish, well, you're objectively wrong. You were created on purpose for a specific purpose, to flourish and to help others flourish also. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. No, that's no, okay. It, it seems that all their assumptions, just to go off that, are kind of really baseless. Like Matt Delahunty will say, well, it's well-being. And so if you're right. not, like, well, well, what was his name? Gordon Peterson suggested to him, well, if, if your goal is to, say, get rid of suffering, you, you can kill yourself. You stop right. suffering if that's your goal. Right. And Matt Delahunty says, well, yeah. if you're not being, then that's not well-being. It's like, why well-being? Why yeah, I, that? Again, right? 
and I want to bring it back. I'll keep bringing it back to this. I agree. It's bad when humans suffer. We need to seek to try to alleviate suffering. Why? Because that's, we were created on purpose and for the specific purpose to flourish and not to suffer. Yeah. And, and Jesus made it clear. Love God first and everybody love everybody from your neighbors to your enemies. So go help people. Try yeah. to alleviate suffering. Try to help people flourish. So it's only makes, I mean, it, it, if that's an objectively true statement that we ought not suffer and that we ought to flourish, atheism doesn't make sense of that. You're dust in the wind. There's probably no libertarian freedom anyway. And so you can't do anything about it. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, but on Christianity, it makes sense. Yeah. Sam Harris will say, well, why do you need God for that? Why can't I just help my fellow neighbor because or why can't I flourish just because I intuitively know it's bad to suffer? And it's like, yeah, sure. But that's epistemology. That's how you know it. Right, you right, right. You don't need the theological jump for the ontological argument yeah. to justify, to ground it in something yeah. beyond just your opinion. Right. Which and, I think is. And, you know, the Nazis probably, you know, disagreed. They didn't think that all humans uh, should not be suffering. Um, and, and, you know, so that's what you need. Well, look, there's a, a logical foundation that opposes the Nazi political platform or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and you were created on purpose for a specific purpose to help all humans flourish. And you guys oppose that. So you're opposed to objective reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Nazis were, Democrat Party is with abortion. <laughs> no, okay, yeah. now Republicans don't get everything right either, right? Yeah, right. This is the biggest issue, biggest issue. Let's start there and work our way down. Well, let's work on both parties. Both mm -hmm. parties need a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the, the biggest... second part of the moral argument as far as developing a good atheist rebuttal is against moral realism. So one of the things that us as theists argue is that, you know, we have more of a reason to trust our intuitive sense that it is objectively evil to do certain things like torture maybe for fun. Yeah. We have more of justification to trust that instinct than to trust by justify any argument against moral realism right. to say there aren't objective moral facts. Yeah. And I, I was going to try to come up with an atheist rebuttal to that would just be to say, well, through the process of our evolution, it became so ingrained that it had to feel objective. And so there are certain studies that Jordan Peterson talks about among rats, where they even have a sense of fair play. And so if you have a big rat who can easily beat a little rat in a wrestling match, if he doesn't let the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat won't keep playing with him. So even at the, those low levels of evolution, there's a sense of fair play and, and justice that has to go on, even though it's objective. But so then by the time it reaches humans in the process of evolution, it's so ingrained in us, it feels objective, that we have to have, engage in a sense of fair play, but, but it's not. Yeah. But again, I mean, that, there's a problem there. Uh, you can't derive an ought from an is, right? So if that's just the way it is. Exactly. Um, and, that would be my, my atheist argument, that's just the way it is. Right. Yeah, I mean, if rats thirty percent of the time, are, you know, have fair or you know whatever it was that you said. I mean, that that's just describing the way it is, not the way it ought to be. Absolutely. And if there is no libertarian freedom, then you have no ability to make a choice otherwise. If you're determined um, to be Hitler, right? Yeah. Or so. Um, that, and that's so, exactly my atheist position, by the way, is that there are no odds. Yeah, and if there are no odds, then uh, there's nothing wrong with Hitler. There's nothing wrong with Trump. There's nothing wrong with fill in the blank with your favorite politician or least favorite. Uh, yeah. There's nothing wrong with it in an objective sense. Mm -hmm. But if there is, if anybody ever really gets something wrong in an objective sense, then yeah. say goodbye to atheism. Yeah. So, so I have two rebuttals to that, and I want to. I'm more interested in what you think of the second one, but I'll say the first one because it's kind of quicker, which is. It's impossible to behave consistently with that worldview, right? And so if you go along the Jordan Peterson line, which is what you really believe is how you act. It's not what you say you believe. It's how you act. Right. You yeah. can't act consistently with that. So the way reality really would be, for example, is that people can rape somebody else, but then they can get away with it, live a good life, and die. And they've never gotten justice, right? That's just the way reality works out some of the time. But of course... We don't behave like that. We try to prosecute people like that to the fullest extent of the law. And we say, no, there really is justice, and we're going to met out justice on this person. Right. We can't even behave consistently with that. Yeah. Well, no, that's a, 
I think I think I'm tracking with that. And you know, uh, last summer I was on the Berkeley campus in uh, in San Francisco, and um, and uh, spent a lot of time on the, on that campus. And and I would have conversations with uh, with the professors and students there. And I would ask him, I said, do you believe in objective morality? There's some things that are objectively good, bad, right, wrong, and evil, no matter what anybody else thinks. And surprisingly, a lot of them would just uh, say, no, that, that doesn't make sense. There's nothing objectively good, bad, right, wrong, fair, or, or evil. Um, it was like they knew where it was going. It was going to point to God, you know. Mm. And then I would ask him, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd say, uh, What's your stance on uh, Trump's policies right now? Do you think some of those are really wrong? And some would be like, yeah, yeah, that he is really wrong. I'm like, well, you said it wasn't wrong. <laughs> now, now, some of them were, were too smart, you know, and they realized, no, no, that's not really wrong what Trump's doing. Um, and I said, well, so is it just your opinion versus his? And why should your opinion count more than his? And that got some of their a attention. And then th those who are really staying strong there's like nothing wrong well then you, you bring up hitler again and you say was it wrong what hitler did and one guy one philosopher uh or philosophy student he said no there was nothing objectively wrong with what hitler did and i'll never forget what happened here i didn't say anything i just looked at him and then he just looked straight down at his shoes we were both standing up and uh, he looked down at his shoes he took a step back he started moving his foot back and forth and he looked back up at me he goes that doesn't sound right i said it sure doesn't and it's because you're objectively wrong yeah. <laughs> and then he goes well how would we even make sense of that and i said well consider this what if god exists because he was an atheist i said what if god exists and created humanity on purpose and for a specific purpose and then entered into the world to tell us exactly what that purpose was so that we could stand in an epistemic position to know and to make it clear that our purpose was to love all people as ourselves from our neighbors to our enemies. I said, what if, as I said, if that's true, then there would be something true about humanity, objectively true about humanity, irrespective of the subjective opinions from humanity and we would stand in a position to know. And he, I'm not going to say he became a Christian on the spot, uh, <laughs> but right. we exchanged information and he said, you have given me something to think about. And uh, so pray for that guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, you, you had another, you had a second point, didn't you? I did have a second point. And yeah. so I was motivated to develop this from a cosmic skeptic who argues that there is no objective realm of moral values. And he says, it's the burden of proof is on the purse, making the positive claim that there is a realm of objective moral values. Now, never mind. I kind of, I do disagree with that. I think the burden of proof is on the person who says we shouldn't trust our instinct, that rape is really wrong, that right. you know, is really wrong. But I, I, I did feel the need to kind of take that burden of proof and say, well, can I prove that there is a realm of objective moral values? And I kind of derived this from listening a lot to Jordan Peterson, which is, I don't think you can separate physical reality from metaphysical values, right? So the atheist claim would, would be that there's physical reality, but there's no realm of values. And I'm, I'm not convinced that you can actually separate the two. So for example, if I were to ask you, what is an apple, mm -hmm. right? You can describe it to me in purely physical terms, right? but you, you can't actually separate that from the action. I, I can eat it. I use it to nourish myself. Now, as far as action is, is related, you could also say, well, I can use it as a weapon to throw and hit somebody with, right? But, but the value, what the value does is it limits those um, methods of action to, well, certain ones are right and better than others and certain ones are wrong. It's more useful to nourish me. It's, more, it's meant to nourish me. We can see that the apple has a purpose. The purpose yeah. isn't used as a weapon. It's meant to nourish. And what intelligent design, not intelligent design, artificial intelligence developers, kind of, they ran into a problem called the frame problem, which was they thought they could build, build a robot with eyes that could just see the world and that was it, right? Mm -hmm. And what it turned out was that if the robot didn't have a body, it couldn't actually see anything because there was an infinite number of ways it could interpret the things in front of them. And only if you have a body and can interpret that in, in a sense of action, could, could it see. 
Mm. And so in other words, you can't see reality. Seeing reality is the mapping of it onto action. And so what I, well, as far as I'm concerned is it, an apple wouldn't even make sense if there was no action to take. We couldn't look at it and know what it is without, without action. And so mm. I think like Jordan Pearson always asks the question, why are a tree stump and a beanbag both a chair? They don't share hardly any physical properties in common, but it's because we both we see both a tree stump and a beanbag as something you can sit on. Yeah. And even our brains are even wired to think that way. For, so if I look at a glass, my I see the glass, but I don't see just something to hold water water in. I see something I can drink from. And so your eyes, some of some of your eye, what your eyes see actually skip the parts of your brain where you actually see it, and they go straight to your motor functions. So if I look at a cup, it automatically sends information to my motor functions to make my hand do this, to pick it up. Wow. So that, that's just all kind of jumbled thoughts. But I, So yeah. I think physical reality and values are tied together because values limit how you can properly function in physical reality. I don't know what you sure. think. No, I'm, I'm really intrigued. I've never heard of any of this before. So this is all new. I'm thinking about it um, on the fly right here. My only, my, my only pushback uh, at the moment would be, well, Okay, what about the angelic realm? They don't have bodies. Um, can they see things and make sense of physical reality? And do they have moral? Uh, I mean, according to scripture, they would have moral values. So that's just, yeah, yeah that's just the first thing that pops up in my head. That, that's a good question. I don't know, because I, I don't know what the angelic realm is like. Right. I mean, we, right. we know that for... Oh. Yeah, I mean, you're you're exactly right. We don't know what it's like, um, but we're gonna have. Yeah, let's get back to that. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. You need to think about that one, because mm -hmm. if I was an atheist, that's where I would go. According to your worldview, you believe in angels. Well, how do you make sense of this? Well, it's well. So that'd be that'd be. I guess we we would be assuming angels could come into earth and function. And the question would be, well, could they function if they weren't given a physical body? And we know that angels as immaterial minds and in an immaterial realm, maybe are moral creatures. But, but so that wouldn't negate that you could separate physical reality from that moral realm. That maybe if, even if you're going to create a moral, a physical realm that has to have that realm of values tied yeah. into it. So, Mr. Tim, sir, yes. when we as Christians, not that we've ever talked about this before, when we as Christians, <laughs> for somebody who hasn't heard the term Molinism, it sounds like some kind of belief that just came out of nowhere. Well, this, this is something odd. But, right. but, but what is it? Is it really something so far-fetched? So, Molinism is derived from uh, the thinking of a Spanish theologian uh, in the 1600s. Um, Luis de Molina was his name. And uh, what I've done is I'm really, what I try to argue for is something called mere Molinism. Um, and that's just two propositions. And so the, the first is this, uh, that one logically prior to God's decision to create the world, God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. Now, I, uh, I'll say that if that's true, then this entails what's called middle knowledge. So again, the first ingredient is that logically prior to God's decision to create the world, God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. So he knew all that he could do, everything that was in within his omnipotent power. Um, he knew everything he could do, even the things that he would never do. Right? So he knew everything he could do and all that would happen if he created those scenarios because he's omniscient, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the second thing to, the second essential ingredient then is, the, is this. As beings created in the image of God, humans, like God, possess libertarian freedom. And as I said earlier, what I mean by that is that's the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with human nature. Now, so I say that once one affirms those two things, those two propositions, then you are a Molinist, or at least a mere Molinist. Now, uh, we can make sense then of how God can predestine all things, all things, without causally determining 
all things without making it happen, right? He can leave some things up to us and really be up to us because they're not caused or determined by anything other than us. So it follows from that that if an omnipotent God could create a being with free will, that I just said is the ability to choose between a range of options consistent or compatible with their nature, then God must possess uh, middle knowledge. Um, yeah. And this middle knowledge simply means all that would, uh, I'll say it again, um, all that would happen in any possible scenario that God could create. If that entails the ability to create free creatures, then God's got middle knowledge. So if humans are free or even could be free, in a certain sense, and God um, possesses this knowledge, then you get some flavor of Molinism. And surprisingly, uh, well, I, I, I'm trying to build bridges between uh, where there is, I'm trying to build bridges in the church or behind the door of the church where there has been division over the past 500 years. Yeah. And I'm finding that by finding things this way, um, Calvinists and Arminians and a whole bunch of people from different, um, you know, they're, they're different sides of the aisle in the church are coming together and meeting in the aisle. So, you know, in my dissertation, I'm pointing out that uh, everybody from, let's say, I think I'm, I'm starting with Augustine, moving all the way through uh, Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon, uh, the Arminius, the Synod of Dort, uh, everybody between um, Augustine and even, like I said, Calvin, Luther, and Melanchthon uh, would affirm some instances of libertarian freedom, even if they rejected it regarding issues pertaining to salvation. Um, or what we call soteriology. And so if anybody affirms at least one instance of libertarian freedom, and they affirm that God was still sovereign over that libertarianly free thing, then the, I, the only way I can see to make sense of that is through middle knowledge and through Molina's yeah. ideas. And so you've got to have what I call mere Molinism, even if one rejects the idea of freedom, libertarian freedom relating to salvation issues. So that's basically what I'm working on right now and it's a lot of fun right on so not to open up a whole new can of worms but what one thing i'm hearing that's confusing is that you know some calvinists would accept what you just said the mere molds yeah. and right. but they would reject it with issues pertaining to salvation yeah i i, I don't understand what would be the motivation for that because to me it would either be determined all the way through or not determined all the way through. I, I don't see why there would have to be a switch on their part. Well, I think, you know, to be fair to my Calvinist brothers and sisters, yeah. the reason why they would do that is because of how they interpret biblical data. Now, I disagree with their interpretation, but that's yeah. another conversation. Um, what I'm willing to do, though, is for the sake of conversation and for the sake of unity, saying, okay, look, even though I disagree um, on your stance regarding TULIP, right, the five points of Calvinism, which uh, gets deterministic um, regarding salvation issues, at least you're affirming libertarian freedom in other areas, um, namely rationality, like we talked to. Uh, Gr Greg Kokel is a great example of this. Yeah. Uh, Greg Kokel of Stand Reason Ministries, highly respected guy. I've had several uh, good face to face conversations with him. And um, he is a Calvinist who affirms TULIP, right? All five points of Calvinism. Uh, he's an ardent Calvinist. But um, like other Calvinists, I'm thinking of guys like Alan Flanaga and Kevin Tempe and Oliver Crisp and uh, uh, Mueller. I can't think of his first name right now. Um, you've got these other Calvinists, and Greg Kokel is one of them. He says, look, we've got to have libertarian freedom or we can't be rational, right? <laughs> like we talked about earlier. For rationality, if I'm going to rationally conclude that Calvinism is true, then I've got to I've got to have libertarian freedom uh, when it comes to thinking, and so he does. Greg Kokel does affirm uh, five points of tulip and determinism when it comes to salvation issues, but he also is a libertarian and issues external to uh, salvation. And so, although we have our disagreements, we can we're unified on libertarian freedom. We're we're both libertarian freedom fighters. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I think that's a that's important. It's finding common ground. Yeah. Definitely. One thing I was talking on about before with a friend was 
you know, the old earth versus young earth debate. Right. What I see is a lot of, you know, straw manning coming from both sides against the other side. And I would really wish we could just agree to disagree. Yeah, right. I totally agree. Um, I mean, if I ever come back on for another podcast, we can get into that. So <laughs> I, mean, we, I have a lot of thoughts. On yeah, that. I've got a lot of thoughts on that. And I've gone from one extreme clear to the other and then somewhere in the middle. Um, that, that's but, me. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll just really quickly say where we are in the middle and then where, where, where the extremes we started on and ended up on. Yeah, where did you start? Young Earth. Me too. I was, I was a Ken Ham fan. I was a Ken right. Ham fanboy. And, right. uh, pardon me? Kent Hovind. Kent Hovind too. Yeah. I love the guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, as a youth pastor, former youth pastor, I used to make all the kids watch Kent Hovind VHS videos. Nice. I, I regret that now, you know, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I started there and then, uh, I went clear to the other extreme. Um, and I became a hardcore old earth. That was the only way. Um, and now I'm more, I, I lean old. I think that I, 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 my position is this. I think the Bible is silent after studying hermeneutics. I've come to the conclusion that I think the Bible is probably silent regarding the age of the universe. Um, and if God's word is silent on an issue, then you're free to study God's work on the issue. And studying mm -hmm. God's work is science, right? Yeah. So, so I always tell my scientist friends, I'm like, well, I'm a theologian who studies God, God's word. You're a theologian who studies God's work. And so if, if God's word is silent on an issue, follow uh, the study of God's work, follow the scientific data. And I think it's pretty heavy that it's old, but I'm quick to say I could be wrong and I'm willing to have my mind changed. And bottom yeah. line, young earth creationists and old earth creationists are all creationists. We all believe that the Bible is the inspired inerrant word of God. We just think that each other's interpretation of certain parts are wrong. Yeah. But when we, elite, when we say that that's the issue, it's how one, I think your interpretation is wrong. I think your hermeneutics is, is faulty here. Um, well, I'm willing to be corrected on that. And I just challenge those who disagree with me to be willing to be corrected on their hermeneutics also, because we agree on everything else that God created and that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Now let's figure out how to interpret it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, one of the things I've been convinced of is kind of a final thought, especially from watching like Kent Hovind and stuff is even if the earth is billions of years old, I would still see the evidence for dinosaurs living thousands of years ago pretty compelling. Yeah. Per personally, I, I, and I don't see how that would necessarily be a contradiction. I think there's good historical evidence that man probably had some interaction with them. And then some, some of the, you know, fossilized blood cells, you know, mm -hmm. that are, are fresh that we can still find, I think is interesting. Well, you know, I, I mean, what gets my attention more than anything is just the cosmological uh, data. So well, I honestly haven't studied the earth sciences as much as I have physics and mm -hmm. uh, um, big bang cosmology. And, yeah. and interestingly, the, you know, I would say that the, the scientific data that strongly points to the existence of God more than any other is the same scientific data that points to an old, uh, an old universe, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. you know, think of the Kalam cosmological argument. And yeah. So. Yeah, that's so. great. That, that's one of the reasons I became kind of disinterested a couple of years back with the age of the earth, because it was like, well, why am I arguing over the age of the earth when I could just be saying, hey, look, regardless of how old it is, look, it had a beginning. The yeah. evidence that is pretty compelling for a God. I kind of got away from it for those reasons. Yeah, I, I actually just published an article on Sean McDowell's website this last week called Stealing Defeat from the Jaws of Victory. Um, mm -hmm. You can find a longer version of it, too, on on my website, but there's a good short read on Sean McDowell's uh, on Sean McDowell.org called stealing defeat from the jaws of victory. And that's my point is that that's what Christians do when we deny the big bang um, or when we object to the big bang, because it is scientific evidence of Genesis one. Well, yeah, yeah. I think, I think one of the things people often confuse is the big bang versus the big bang model. Right. And so I'm so like talking specifically about the Big Bang, that's the evidence we would typically agree on that points to the universe having a beginning. Um, yeah. The model, some some versions of the model say, no, it, it only works in a billions of years retrospect. And there, there are certain 
parts of you know the stellar revolution that go along in that but you you can separate them to an extent yeah. and agree on the, the basic evidence for the big bang but that, that's right. just my yeah on it. but anyway we're out of time do you have anything coming up that people should be on the lookout for oh uh, let's see um going back to berkeley uh <laughs> um soon but uh no i'm going to new orleans uh march 8th i'll be there 7th 8th and 9th i think i'm uh giving a talk on the 8th uh called the apologetic significance of molinism and i'm showing how uh, all of um or a majority of dr craig's arguments in the cumulative case and other arguments um all presuppose um, an essential ingredient of Molinism, um, or, or they're strengthened by Molinism. Um, and so I get into things like, uh, the moral argument, uh, the Kalam. I have two different aspects of how the Kalam is strengthened by or supported by Molinism. Uh, the fine tuning argument, uh, the free thinking argument uh, that I shared earlier. Um, and then showing how Molinism uh, destroys, as the Apostle Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 10.5, uh, the, the, the number one objection raised or argument raised against the knowledge of God is the problem of evil. Well, I think uh, Molinism just destroys the problem of evil, as Paul would say, and uh, not just the problem of moral evil, but also the problem of natural evil. And also what most people would consider to be gratuitous evil shows that it's not gratuitous, uh, at least in, in some sense. And so, um, yeah, I think Molinism, I really think uh, if one wants to be an apologist, they should also be a Molinist because it just strengthens all the arguments or the majority of them or is uh, supported by it. So that's what okay. we're going to be talking about. Yeah, that's awesome. So keep an eye out for that, guys. The website is freethinkingministries.com. You can follow him on Twitter at TS Express. Tim Stratton, thank you so much for being here, brother, and I hope to have you back soon. Hey, let's do it. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me.